Good morning. My name is Ginger Guidry, and I am honored to be here with you this morning sharing some reflections. Two summers ago, I was with my family and some friends in Curie Beach, North Carolina. For those who haven't been, Curie Beach is part of an island just south of Wilmington and is a locals beach with an amusement park and a fishing pier. We went up to the pier after dinner to get ice cream from the store that also sells bait and tackle and stroll around. I was curious when a sign on one door said, no shark fishing, while a sign on another door said, shark permits, $12. <laughs> As we finished up our cones, we saw a crowd gathering on one edge of the pier. I squeezed in to see what was attracting so much attention. A few guys were throwing chum, or large chunks of fish, into the water. Leaning over the railing of the pier, I watched in disbelief and awe as sharks, maybe five to six feet long, emerged from the depths to feed on the chum. They were graceful and powerful, swirling around to grab the fish before disappearing again below. It was mesmerizing. Lifting my gaze, I could see people swimming in the surf not far away. Then another crowd began to gather further up the pier. Apparently, someone had actually hooked a shark and was attempting to reel it in. It was too heavy to lift up to the pier, so the fishermen walked down to the beach and reeled it in through the surf. Some of his friends went out and dragged the thrashing shark up onto the beach by its tail. My heart was breaking for this creature. I had just witnessed its majesty in the water, and now it was on the shore, struggling to breathe. I braced myself to watch its fate unfold and see what these guys would do next. Well, of course, they took selfies with the shark. One guy even put his hat on the shark, which was now moving minimally. All the while, my stomach was twisting, and a huge crowd had gathered on the pier and on the beach. After a few minutes, someone went up and punched the shark. Here we go, I thought. I expected a crowd frenzy similar to what I've observed when a fight breaks out in an ice hockey game. This was also the summer when there had been a number of shark attacks in North Carolina, and I was anticipating little mercy from the crowd. But to my surprise, the crowd gasped and began to boo when the shark was punched. When the guy attempted to punch the shark again, people began shouting at him, and someone pulled him away. People started yelling, Put it back. Clearly the dominant sentiment of those around us. The shark weakly switched its tail. Then, surprisingly, one of the guys who had caught it started dragging it back to the surf. Once it was in about a foot of water, it slowly swam away, and a huge cheer went up from the crowd. I could feel the relief in those around us. Unexpectedly, the crowd had sided with the shark. Wow, I thought, maybe there's hope. In that moment, the crowd was painfully aware of the shark's plight. If a shark can elicit compassion from a crowd of people, even in the midst of a summer with a number of high-profile shark attacks, maybe it is evidence of our ability to connect with the natural world, maybe even enough to move us to action. We humans have a complicated relationship with the environment around us. We utterly depend on it, and yet we spend much of our time taking it for granted and testing how much we can pollute or destroy before we go too far. My kids watch a lot of nature shows, and always toward the end, there's the inevitable part when the scientists talk about how this cool creature you've just been watching and which you now newly appreciate is in decline. In fact, a report released a few days ago suggests that we may be seeing the warning signs of mass population decline in our fellow land animals, even in species of, quote, low concern, like barn swallows. Or maybe we feel the environment is infinite, a falsehood that is slowly becoming harder to maintain. I once heard an environmental science professor say that, given the magnificent volume of the Earth's atmosphere, it is astounding that we have managed to pollute it. And we now know that even if we reduce air pollutants in one part of the world, global air currents bring contaminants from elsewhere, especially to the poles. Ask the native people in Alaska about the contaminants in their traditional foods, 
from industries they don't even have or economically benefit from. I've heard one UPIC elder lament that they are the most polluted people on the earth. We are all in this together. Awareness and connection to nature has always been a part of my spirituality. Growing up on a farm in Maryland, it just made sense to me that the human and natural worlds were intertwined. After college, I moved out west and was introduced to the grandeur of the Rockies. It was pretty easy for me to feel close to God when on top of a 14,000-foot mountain, looking down at the tops of clouds and the backs of soaring birds. When I moved to Arizona and met my future husband, Chris, we spent the first six months of our relationship backpacking nearly every other weekend. We witnessed the fantastic diversity of Arizona's altitudes, from the subtle beauties of the desert to the deep richness of the pine forests. At that time, I was working with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, a one-year service program similar to AmeriCorps, but with a focus on spirituality, community, and simple living. I worked in a residential treatment center for adolescent girls who were in rehab as an alternative to juvenile detention. Having grown up in a stable and fairly privileged home, I was introduced to the raw challenges of poverty, drugs, and mental illness, and the cycles of abuse that are often at the root of it all. My heart was open to the pain that some people experience and spend their lives struggling to overcome. As a Jesuit volunteer, I was immersed in the social justice teachings of the Catholic Church, and the love and compassion I was living resonated with my core. Yet, the singular focus on our human brothers and sisters, with limited mention of our place in the broader natural world, even as climate change was beginning to loom, struck me as disconnected. One of the reasons I have gravitated to UU churches is the filling of this gap. Yes, here is a denomination that acknowledges our connection to the environment and its basic tenets, while also striving for social justice. I faced a similar dilemma when I applied to graduate school. Unable to decide between public health and environmental science, I applied to both types of programs. I discovered the field of environmental health in my second year at UNC. This discipline measures how environmental conditions like air or water pollution, impact health. As a graduate student, I was astounded to learn of the volume of scientific literature about the health impacts of air pollution, even at levels that we might consider acceptable. Air pollution is linked not only to asthma attacks and respiratory problems, but also to heart attacks. Cardiovascular problems are actually the major cause of premature deaths when air pollution increases. But air pollution is also associated with many other problems, like preterm birth, low birth weight, and interfering with brain development in ways that appear to lead to autism, ADHD, and other behavioral problems. Surely, I thought, once people are aware of these health effects, especially on children, we will change our ways. But I learned that as with many issues, knowledge is not enough. And then came Pope Francis, who took his name to honor the Catholic St. Francis of Assisi, who lived simply and celebrated nature. In 2015, he wrote an encyclical titled Laudato Si, or Praise Be to You, and subtitled On Care for Our Common Home. This was the document he gave to President Trump when they met in May. Studying it, hanging on his every word, I again thought, wow, maybe there's hope. The encyclical calls for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the planet, a conversation that invites wisdom from all branches of science, plus the cultural riches of different peoples, their art and poetry, and their spirituality. While praising worldwide ecological movements, Pope Francis notes that, regrettably, many efforts to seek concrete solutions to the environmental crisis have proven ineffective, not only because of powerful opposition, but also because of more general lack of interest. He acknowledges the science on climate change and other human impacts to the planet. He links our environmental degradation to our lifestyles of consumption 
and rapidification, or the ever-increasing pace of life mentioned in the reading. He dares us to become so aware of the impacts of our lifestyles that they become personal, and we perhaps do something about them. For my dissertation, I studied how air pollution from huge hog and poultry farms in eastern North Carolina affect the health of people living nearby. 99% of the hogs and poultry raised in North Carolina are produced in these factory farms. In North Carolina, these large operations are an environmental justice issue, meaning that low-income communities and African-American or Latino communities bear more of the negative impacts than higher-income white communities. As an aside, almost any form of environmental pollution is borne disproportionately by low-income communities and communities of color. Landfills, wastewater treatment plants, oil refineries, hazardous waste sites, roadway pollution, I could go on and on. With colleagues at UNC and local partners in eastern North Carolina, we found that air pollution from these operations was linked to symptoms like, like headaches and irritation of the eyes and nose, as well as increased blood pressure, which can have a cascade of health effects. Perhaps just as importantly, the plumes of air pollution harm quality of life and keep people from getting outside, doing activities they enjoy. Just imagine if on a regular basis, there was a rotten odor around your home that was so bad you felt sick and didn't want to go outside. These huge operations produce much more than your average farm smells. Most of my colleagues in eastern North Carolina were African American, and they taught me volumes about the lifelong racism and environmental injustices they knew. They became very dear to me, and the problems they experienced in their backyards became personal to me as well. But there is no denying that at the end of the day, I drove back to Chapel Hill, where there are no factory farms, and my research challenging the livestock industry did not threaten my neighbors with potential consequences for friendships or employment. Now I work at the part of the National Institutes of Health that funds environmental health research, but I am not conducting studies. The longer I am away from my personal connections to the people whose health, property, and way of life are daily affected by this injustice, the easier it is to be insulated from taking action. It takes extra effort for me to remain connected. But it is time for extra effort. Pope Francis calls this out as one of the greatest challenges of environmental destruction. The people with the most influence on the issues, those in elected office and running companies, or simply with a high standard of living that generates the most waste, are also the least affected by the impacts. He says they, or we, live and reason from the comfortable position of a high level of development and a quality of life well beyond the reach of the majority of the world's population. He says the lack of physical contact with the downstream impacts can lead to a numbing of conscience and a tendency to neglect reality, because we can. And yet in this room, I know there are people who care deeply about environmental issues and work constantly to achieve social justice. These issues are connected. Pope Francis makes the point repeatedly that we have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice and debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So I challenge you to find these connections in whatever issues you are passionate about and hold fast to them. When I first drafted this sermon, the president had just made the decision to withdraw from the Paris Accord on Climate Change. Earlier this week, an iceberg the size of Delaware broke off of Antarctica. But rather than encourage you to eat less meat or turn your air conditioning up a degree or drive less, all important actions, I'm going to encourage you to connect. Build authentic relationships with your colleagues and neighbors, as well as your friends. Stand in awe of the beauty and bounty around us. Connect with people with differing political views Put the devices down and go outside in the evenings to hear the summer orchestra. Look for environmental threads in your social justice work. Visit places that are dear to you and are changing 
so you become painfully aware of the impacts and motivated to contribute to change. After the shark incident, one of my friends noted that nothing about that scene played out as he expected. If folks on a fishing pier can root for a shark's survival, there is already a common cause between us. We have to find ways to tap into people's vast capacity for compassion to get things to move. By caring for each other, we care for nature. And by caring for nature, we care for each other. Perhaps this is the way to build a better common home. <laughs>